Yeah, uh, about, but yeah, apologies for all the changing around. Mm -hmm. I think this is all for, for the better. You're going to have the first time I think a Slack Stanford joined somewhere because the same speaker is going to speak at both places. <laughs> <laughs> we just missed, uh, you know, uh, seeing things through. But anyways, we're very happy to have, uh, uh, thank you to uh, Sebastian and Davide and Amol for putting this, uh, merging these uh, seminars together. We're very happy to have Oren uh, here from, from NYU. Uh, and he's going to tell us about uh, stuff about SI. Thank okay. you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm happy to bring everyone together. That's great. Um, yeah, no, it's really thanks for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, let me move this thing. Do you know how to get rid of this? Yeah. Uh, yes. I need to meet you from the Yeah. Cool. Yes. Okay. Great. So, yeah, so I'm going to be talking. So, okay, so this is the title of my talk, right? But, um, you know, people tell me that when there's a question mark in your title, the answer is always no. Okay. So, actually, uh, oh, why is this not working now? Okay. So, I'm changing the title. I believe that there is a path actually to detecting or ruling out certain models of self-interacting dark matter, something that's been kind of a long standing question in you know, uh, this kind of intersection of particle physics and astrophysics. And I'm gonna tell you today what I think is the path forward and how like, in the next few years, I think we'll be able to make decisive claims about these types of theories. Okay, so that's the topic of today's talk. And I'm gonna be talking about um, a lot of preliminary stuff in the second half of the talk. The first half of the talk, I'm gonna be talking about mostly these three archive numbers over here, okay? Um, good. So the outline of, of my talk is as follows. Uh, in talk, um, dark sector can be very really important, but I'm just going to talk about the specific model I'm going to have today, even though it's going to be kind of a generic model that you can map onto many other models. Um, after that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through observations um, and constraints slash evidence for these types of models that exist in astrophysical data. I'm going to walk you through data from cluster scales down to galactic scales and then down to dwarfs uh, or satellite galaxy scales. And I'm going to pause for a few minutes in this very strong claims about self interacting dark matter fitting data or evidence for self interacting dark matter doing very well from these galactic rotations. I'm going to make the point that that's slightly less clear than has been made out to be in the literature. Okay, so I'm gonna stop, stop with that. And then if you don't remember anything from this talk, just remember you know, the following statement, which is that if you put these three things together, what you find is that they point to a strongly velocity dependent cross section. So strongly velocity dependent that at 10 kilometers per second, self interactions, yeah, that at 10 kilometers per second of incoming particle velocity, uh, cross sections are so large that a process called gravithermal collapse is active in some of the Milky Way satellites. Okay, and I'm going to tell you that the second point actually has observational signatures, and I'm going to talk about what those observational signatures are. And I think this is going to be the way forward, basically. So if you remember nothing from the talk, just remember these two lines. Okay, and then I'm going to summarize. Good. Um, okay, so let's start. So just a brief, like, you know. Introduction to dark sectors, but really, I'm going to make, make very brief. You know, we know there's a standard model, and we know there is some dark sector that has to have at least one cosmologically stable. Thing. Okay. Maybe we'll switch on your audio if we manage, because uh, the audio is not working. I don't know why. Unhide the control. You didn't join the audio. Yeah, you can join. How do I unhide the control? How do I unhide the control? No, no, Yes, I don't know. Oh, okay. okay, now, yeah. Got it. Like that. Got it. Now, 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 can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. I can just. Yes. And your audio Try to prepare everything. Okay, can someone on Zoom say if they can hear me now? The audio is still fine on Zoom. Uh, but you, you can hear you can hear me now, yeah? Okay. Always. 
Oh, you could hear me from the beginning. I, I think it's different for different people. Some of us were having issues, some weren't. Are we good now? Yes? Uh, it's good for me, but some people are saying they still don't have sound. Still no sound. Okay, so I'm going to continue. It sounds like most people can hear me now. So if someone cannot, it might be a problem with your uh, system. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Do you want to add that? Okay, so I'm going to continue, and David, let me know if I should stop again. Okay, okay uh, good. So yeah, so we know that there is a dark sector. We know it has in it at least a dark matter candidate that is cosmologically stable, and that is, you know, has a, a, a viable production mechanism in the early universe. And you know, there might be additional symmetries in the dark sector, and there might be some kind of mediation also with the standard model. So for today's talk, I'm going to be considering a specific, very simple, secluded dark sector, secluded from the standard model in the sense that mediation is going to be, you can go to zero if you wanted to. And the specific model I'm going to talk about is a model that has a single dark matter candidate, chi, fermion, but it doesn't have to be, but let's say fermion, and some dark force carrier, some vector or scalar dark force carrier, and some self-coupling in the standard model, in the dark sector. An alpha, you can think of it as being the dark fine structure constant, it's a vector, or some Yukawa coupling squared. Okay. But everything I'm going to say maps onto many other models, and I'll tell you what I mean in a minute. But importantly, I'm also going to be completely agnostic to mediation with the standard model. So if you want any epsilon, any coupling to the standard model to go to zero, that's absolutely fine. I'm going to make the claim that even though most experimental constraints go away when you do this, actually astrophysical signals and constraints do not go away. I'm going to tell you what they are. <coughs> Good. So just to go into the model a little bit more, right? This is the vertex that you can write down. Uh, so that the chi particle, the mediator, and some alpha. And one of the diagrams that you can write down is this uh, self-interacting diagram. There's also a U-channel, but let's just take this one for an example. And um, in the limit where alpha is large or M phi is sufficiently small, the cross-section for this diagram is large enough for us to care about this cross-section on astrophysical scales. And I'm going to call that the self-interacting limit of this model. Okay. So assuming the phi is massive. Yeah, assuming the phi is massive, otherwise long range, but let's keep phi massive, for example. Okay. But if you go now to small alpha or sufficiently large M phi, then even though this diagram exists, interactions happen so slowly that we don't have to care about them for any purposes in astrophysics. And any astrophysicist would look at this model and say, oh, this is just called the collision of stock map. So I want you to think of CDM and SIDM as just two limiting cases of the same model. And that actually is a pretty generic thing that happens in dark sectors. Yeah. You're asking about production? Yeah, like how can this affect? Uh, and that's going to be the topic of this talk. Okay, it's through gravity. Okay, and through like non-trivial interactions inside the static. Well, there is a range of alpha where you can also radiate this guy away. Sure, I'm going to work in the regime where that's an unimportant effect, but that is an important effect in certain regimes of this model. But today I'm going to do the lowest hanging fruit, which is the case where you just have self interactions. And no dissipation. Oh, cool. No, no cool. There was no uh, equilibrium. There need not be equilibrium between standard model and dark matter. And uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. And just to motivate this model a little bit more. So, as I said, you know, there's a self interacting diagram. There's also an annihilation diagram. You have to play a little bit of games in order to get this, uh, you know, have a nice production mechanism in the early universe. But through this diagram, you can have a kind of secluded freeze out like mechanism. And what I want to say is that there are nice production mechanisms for this model. So it's a well-behaved model in every sense. And so, yeah, as I said, there's thermal production. And also, I'm going to tell you today that there are detectable signatures. Good. Uh, yeah, so this is just what I said already. Now let's go to what the cross-section looks like as a function of incoming particle velocity. 
Okay, so everything in astrophysics is non-relativistic, or everything we're going to do today is going to be non-relativistic. So it's perfectly legal to talk about things in the language of potentials. The relevant potential for this model is just a Yukawa potential. And if you solve the cross-section of the function of incoming particle velocity in the Born approximation, what you get is you get a cross-section that looks like this: constant at low velocity, and then falls off with some power law. It's a log plot at large velocities. Okay, so what's going on here? When velocities are super tiny, the typical momentum transfer in the propagator is much less than the mediator mass, and you just get point scattering. So you can just use dimensional analysis to write down what the cross-section is at zero velocity. Cross-section per unit mass goes like alpha squared m chi over m by four, right? Dimensional analysis. As you increase the velocity, eventually you reach a velocity which is equal to the ratio of the mass of the mediator to dark matter particle in natural units. And when you're above this, v times m5, v times m chi can equal m5, which means that you have enough momentum transfer to probe through the Yukawa barrier, and you see a Cologne potential. And what happens then is you get Muller scattering. It's very similar to electron electron scattering. So you get a fall off with some power. Okay. Good. So for everything, even though this model is a three parameter model, there's really two parameters that you get to constrain through astrophysics. And it's these two combinations of the parameters. And so for today's talk, I'm always going to be placing constraints or you know, saying where there is evidence in the language of this value omega, the ratio of the masses, and this cross section per unit mass at zero velocity. Okay, so these are the two parameters that you're sensitive to from astrophysics. Are you assuming that alpha Born that theorem of probability is true? That the Born approximation is true. Yeah. Also, why? Yes, you you explain that end is kind of like complicated, but it's not just it, I'm, it's, it's just minus two, right. really, or minus four, depending if you want the viscosity transfer cross section. Yeah, it's just it's just, it's just probably four. Two. Sorry, what? This is the the, the vet, This is the 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 dark matter dark matter cross section. So that's right. Scalar exchange. It's scalar exchange, but it could also be a vector exchange. If you do, for the model, it's scalar. Well, I said, I mean, five. You can can be either a vector or a scalar. It doesn't matter. So that would be interesting. Well, what you typically care about actually is the viscosity transfer cross section, uh, because you're asking the question typically in astrophysics whether an interaction transferred energy. And then if you do the calculation for Muller scattering, you get V to the minus four. I think maybe the transfer cross section is minus two, but the actual cross section, if you integrate over angles, is still minus four. Right? Rutherford scattering is minus four. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I, I believe it's the viscosity is definitely minus four, and I think the transfer is minus two. But anyway, there's nothing, the, the, the calculation is simple. The only reason I write b to the minus n is because there's been a confusion in the literature. People like always took only t channel, and recently it was shown that you need to do t and u channel. That's a kind of an obvious statement. When you do that carefully, you know, it's just a different number that people are used to. So I, wrote, I just wrote n so that no one would get upset. That's all. Yeah. Um, but this paper basically is on. Okay, so you, you can. Um, okay, good. So let's put some astrophysical scales onto this plot. And as I said, I'm going to walk you through you know, three different scales the scales of dwarfs at 10 kilometers per second, galaxies at an order of magnitude larger. This is the burial velocities of these objects. And clusters have burial velocities about a thousand kilometers per second. And there is this famous bound that we've all known and loved for many years now of one centimeter squared per gram per bullet cluster. What we always should have said is there is a bound, an upper bound of one centimeter squared per gram at the velocity of the bullet cluster. But the cross section can be order the magnitude larger at smaller velocities. There's no problem with that. You only take into account bullet cluster constraints. And in fact, there has been this ongoing kind of, you know, people who try and study these models and search for evidence in the literature have made claims that about one to 10 centimeters squared per gram at galaxy velocities do very well at explaining this thing called the diversity problem. I'm going to tell you about it in a minute. Okay. And in fact, I'm going to scrutinize that claim in a second. And there's a bit of a question mark. And I'll tell you what that question mark is in exactly a few minutes. Well, or can I ask a, like, this is all squiggle. Fine. How precise is this uh, 
one centimeter squared per gram number. But if I was thinking like in the cluster, they're true, the mirror velocity is like thousand kilometers per second. Mm -hmm. But I might imagine that for these type of constraints, you're dominated by rare low velocity, low relative velocity scattering that you know are not that common, but they interact strongly. Is that properly taken into account when you write a number like this? The answer is no, definitely not for bullet cluster bounds. There, they just like choose. It, it's actually the analysis is done without taking into account velocity dependence. You just write down a cross section and assume that that is the approximate cross section at the velocity of the object. And almost all analyses that have been done have been done in that language. So the answer to your question is no. I am going to show you a slightly more precise bound, which is like updated bullet cluster old news. There are new bounds that come from relaxation of clusters, but. Those bounds also were done under the assumption of constant cross section. So no one's done this carefully. That's your question. Yeah. Um, okay. And then if you go down to even smaller velocity scales, actually, this region of the parameter space was until recently unconstrained. And we were able to place a constraint here that I'll tell you about. Later. Good. So let's just concentrate on this intermediate velocity regime, this 100 kilometer per second regime. I'm going to talk about why there's this question mark. So this figure has already indicated a lot. You were assuming you know, what that is, immediate risk is. If you could pick out the scale between galaxies and is that the ratio the has to be small enough. Well, this is kind of a region that is preferred, right. but I, I don't know, like it's not a real bound, just kind of a hand wavy preference. Right. But I'm going to show you bounds here, and in order to have these bounds and this bound be uphill, you're going to have to have a small enough ratio. I mean, I'm going to talk about that. That's going to be the satellites, yeah, dwarf galaxies and things that have small burial velocities. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, in order to scrutinize this claim, I just want you to realize that SIDM has been invoked to explain this thing called the observed diversity of rotation curves. And to give you a feeling of what this is, let me show you a single plot from these papers, Ren et al. in 2018. And um, what you're seeing here is a bunch of rotation curves that have all been chosen to have approximately the same velocity on the outskirts, between 80 and 90 kilometers per second. This number, is there a question or something? This number is a proxy for the burial mass of the object. Okay, so all of these rotation curves live in very similar burial masses. Okay, and in particular, these are small objects. These are like classical jokes. And they've been color coded the rotation curves from low surface brightness in red to high surface brightness in blue. You see this clear kind of correlation that low surface brightness galaxies tend to turn on slowly, whereas high surface brightness galaxies tend to turn on much faster. Okay. So the question is, there's a number of questions that can be asked. First of all, why in 20 objects that all live in the same burial mass, why are there such a diversity in rotation curves? Second question, why is that diversity correlated with the baryons? And most importantly, why is that true in objects that are so small and baryons are completely subdominant? Okay. And that is the diversity problem. So those kind of three questions. And it turns out, that isothermal profiles do a really nice job at explaining this. And it's easy to understand why that's true. Because if you have an isothermal profile, profile for which the uh, velocity dispersion is constant, and you solve the hydrostatic equilibrium equation, so you just solve Jean's equation in complete equilibrium, no time dependence, what you find is an exponential dependence between the density of the dark matter and the sum of baryon plus dark matter potential. And just through this exponential dependence on phi baryon, you actually get this correct behavior. Okay, so it's happening through gravity, but just because I'm requiring that this number be a constant. Okay, and self-interacting dark matter does this very naturally, because if you have a profile with self-interactions, so you can plot the density as a function of radius, there's going to be some inner region where things are thermalized because of rapid interactions, and so you get a constant temperature. And then in that region, you can solve this equation. And what it turns out is that if you're baryon dominated, you get a cuspy profile. Whereas if you're dark matter dominated, you get a more chord profile. And this exactly goes in the direction of behaving, of 
the bit, this is good, exactly goes in the direction of explaining this behavior. Okay. So, baryon dominated means that after four. Yeah. In the core region, baryon has a significant contribution to the sum. Significantly larger than the dark matter composition. It need not be larger. I mean, I'm, I haven't actually given you any like numbers yet. I'm just telling you the trend. When this is super large, you get something very custom. When this is super small, you get something core. And in the, in the intermediate regime, you get something in between. Okay, good. Now, in order to scrutinize, and, and people have used this to make strong claims about SIDM. They said, oh, SIDM does so well in explaining the diversity problem. And it's, it's a true statement, but I just want to like show you the details of it now so that you get a feeling of what exactly the statement is. Okay, and everything that's been said has been said by analyzing a specific data set called the SPARC data set, Spitzer Photometry and Accurate Rotation Curve data set. It's 175 galaxies that have high quality rotation curve measurements as well as high quality luminosity measurements. So this is a very nice data set that you, you can use it because you have the baryonic profile through some mass to light ratios, you can solve the Poisson equation and get the would be baryon only rotation curve. And then you can compare that to the actual rotation curve and make claims. And it's a big data set that spans a large range of like topologies and luminosities and surface brightnesses. And so, what we did is we took three very simple models and we did a Bayesian analysis of these three models to try and compare them to data carefully. Okay? And the three models we took are a model that attempts to emulate self-interactions in this regime where you're in equilibrium. So that's just the exact picture that I talked about a few minutes ago. So this coring and cusping that is you know, related to the baryons through isothermal. And then two profiles that try to emulate cold dark matter with and without feedback. So the one that emulates cold dark matter without feedback is just an NFW profile with its two free parameters. And then for CDM with feedback, we use this profile called the DC14 profile, which is a profile that's just NFW with additional freedom to core at the center. And that coring is correlated with the ratio of baryon to burial mass of the object. And it's tuned to match simulations that include feedback from supernova. Okay, so it's tuned to these magic simulations. And, um, and yeah, you get behavior that goes in the right direction. Now, just to be clear, all three of these models are very simplistic and incorrect, like they're not perfect models, but these are the precisely same models that were used to make very strong claims to this. Okay, so that's so if anyone doesn't like these models, that's fine, but just know that strong claims have been made about this by comparing this to this. Sorry, what is feedback? Supernova feedback. So, in the SIBM version, you don't feedback. Correct. There is a, a reason for that, actually. Like, the reason is that if you check the time scales, what you find is that typically the time scale for relaxation in SIDN is shorter than the time scale, the dynamical time scale of feedback. And so, if you do simulations with feedback plus SIDN, it looks like SIDN. Yeah. But sure, I mean, that's one of the caveats of everything else. But, but even, this, even in the magic simulations, the, uh, the supernova feedback is. Very out of top, right? It's just like whenever I have a baryon density of above this, I convert arbitrarily some amount of that into the energy. And that's true for all feedback simulation yeah. that you've ever seen. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Correct. I mean, there's additional parameters go, go into that, like for example, the burstiness and the threshold at which you turn on feedback. So you need to form enough stars, and that those, you know, there's a number that goes in, you know, when you're right. dense. So what, what I'm trying to understand is in I had always thought of this as kind of running the other way. Like I was, I had all these random empirical or random parameters in my uh, simulation, and I was kind of picking them to give me things that look like what I see in the real world. Uh, yeah. Sure. And then, but then if I use that to fit a profile, it feels like I'm doing some weird circular fitting. So I don't know exactly what these things are tuned to. And you're asking the question: Is it tuned to the thing that I'm trying to like? Make the yeah. same about now. I believe the answer is is no. Right. It's tuned to other things, so predictions are real. Okay. But yeah, I don't know the actual details of this, and different simulations do different things. Yeah. But what? So M star is your baryon mass here. Correct. Okay. And star larger M star corresponds to more boring. 
actually there's a sweet spot where large there's a sweet, a sweet spot in this ratio that gives you the most amount of core. Yeah. Does this value matter to Kyrie matter or does stellar mass? Uh, yeah, I mean you're asking is gas important? Right. Gas is very subdominant. Yeah, in these galaxies. These are like you know, spiral galaxies that have formed most of their star -like. Yeah. But anyway, this is stellar mass. Good. Okay, so let me just show you some of our results. Okay. So in each, I'm just going to show you three example rotation curves with our best fits. And it's just going to highlight that Spark data is not as nice as you would have wanted. Okay. So in each of these plots is a different rotation curve. The black points are the rotation curve data. And each colored curve is one of our is our best fit for NFW in yellow, DC14 in red, and SIDM in, in green. Okay, so just look at this left rotation curve here, and you'll note that the error bars are tiny, but that there are these non trivial wiggles in the rotation. Okay. So these three models never have a chance of fitting this rotation curve because they just don't have enough freedom. They don't incorporate things like non cylindrical symmetry, which might be important. They don't incorporate things like perturbations and time dependence. And so these models are just not going to be good enough to explain anything that looks like. Do we know what those wiggles are? No, no. Do we think like the cross those error bars? Do you think those wiggles are real? I don't know because the Spark data set is like a hundred and I don't know, like a hundred different papers that someone sat and compiled into a data set. So you really have to go into the details of the observations of each thing in order to in order to know. And I haven't done. That. Yeah. Okay. The rotation curve in the center here. You have to, so the, the issue with this rotation curve is slightly subtle, and you have to know that all analyses that have ever been done on Spark always require that the last three data points have flattened out already, so that the rotation curve is sensitive to the variable mass of the object, so that you have a flat rotation curve. You can see that, and this is an example of a galaxy that passes that quality cut, but you can clearly see that it's not true. Okay, this can cause like flat directions in analysis. Is the horizontal scales and stuff? So I can't see that. Uh, they're different values. They're different horizontal scales. Different scales. Yeah. This is 10 kpc, whereas this is 20. Good. And then the rotation curve on the left is the most um, annoying one. Okay. In the following sense first of all, there's no data below 5 kpc. Second of all, there's this unusual bump that you see over here. But most importantly, and this is the most subtle thing that actually turns out to be super important, you'll notice the typical spread in data is much smaller than the typical error bar. This could mean things like secret correlations between data points or overestimation of error bars. And what it can cause is overfitting. Okay? And claims that were made previously in the literature took overfit results as good results. A chi square per degree of freedom that was you know, 0.1 was thought of as a really good fit. And that's just an incorrect statement. And that happens for like 10% of these objects. Okay. Okay. So this is the, an example. And Spark data basically is just not as great as you would have wanted it to be. And this is kind of the take home plot of this paper where for each fit, we calculated the Bayesian information criterion and compared the Bayesian information criterion of SIDM to one of the CDM models, a histogram data. Okay. So what's plotted here is low surface brightness galaxies on the left, high surface brightness galaxies on the right, and histograms of delta bit between SIDM and one of the CDM models. Yellow is comparing SIDM to NFW. Red is comparing SIDM to DC14. And anything that falls in the gray band between minus six and six, there's just not enough distinguishing power to tell the difference between the models. You see that most of them lie there. And anything that falls to the right is a preference for SIDM. Anything that falls to the left is a preference for the other model. And if you look at these containment regions, these are 25 to 75 percent containment regions, you'll notice that there is a preference for, NF, for SIDM over NFW, right? Most of these lie on the right, but there is very little preference between, F, between SIDM and DC14. Okay. And so. Do you know SIDM as it has parameters. So what is it? Well, mean? okay, you're right. So when people have made this 
explained previously, they've chosen a constant cross section somewhere between one and 10. You can show, you can do this carefully, and you can show that changing it between one and 10 changes very little, it's like a square root dependence on that value. So it makes very little difference. We chose a specific number here. And if you vary it by like a factor of two, you get the same results. Same results. Yeah, because it's like a square root of two. So it's like, it's almost, I mean, you get, it's not exactly the same, but you get qualitatively the same thing. But you're right that no one has done this carefully, you know, and scanned the parameter space and asked, where is the, yeah. So that's a true thing. It's just not been done. Yeah. Does, does this throw out, you know, examples like you said on the for that, or is this also? This throws out about 80 galaxies that didn't pass the quality cut for different reasons. But this includes galaxies that would have passed the quality cut for all of the other analyses, right? So this is the 90 galaxies for which inclination is okay, and the data has there's enough data points, and for which uh, the last three data points do seem to pass the quality cut of being flat. Yeah. Okay. So the take home message is that of galaxies with distinguishing power, NFW is disfavored by most, but there's little preference between DC14 and SIDM. But, you know, I do want to make the caveat. The galaxies that SIDM does well to fit, it does it well with very few free parameters. Whereas, as Jed was pointing out, baryonic feedback requires a ton of free parameters in tuning. Okay? But if you don't care about that fact, then there's little distinguishing power. Spark is just not so good, not good enough. Okay, but now I'm going to ask the opposite question. Right? Like, I agree that the baryonic feedback model seems to be somewhat ad hoc, but once you have DC14, DC14 depends only on the visible uh, mass. That's correct. Yeah, just the, the ratio of visible to, to, to burial mass. Okay, so in in the uh, like when, when I go and look at a particular galaxy, there's only like there's zero free parameter for DC14. Like I measure the visible mass, I measure there's, the, there's four free parameters for all of these models: mass to light ratios and free parameters of the model itself, which are for DC14, some scale radius and some normalization. So there are still three parameters. The amount of coring is not one of them, but it is through like things like mass to light ratios. So, but all of these models have the same number of free parameters. You're safe. But the mass to light ratio is something you measure in Spark. You measure the luminosity. No, the mass to light ratio, you don't measure, you measure light. Good, okay, okay. And there's not sufficient like correlation there, to, like based on the type of stars you see, plus the burial mass or things like this, you're not able to to empirically measure that well enough. There's priors on these, and we place priors, yeah. and we vary those priors to make sure that the result wasn't dependent on those. But those priors are not so strong. Yeah. So, three report. Because there was a could you convert that to something more familiar to me, but such as um, I can't really. I don't know how to do that. This is model comparison. I don't know how to turn that into a signal to you. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask a very simple question? I mean, you're going to eventually probably talk about this, but let me just jump in here. The, the cross section is uh, is this is this, uh, an attractive interaction or repulsive? So actually, it doesn't matter because this is short range interactions, and all you're caring about is in the interaction, did you transfer energy? And actually, in this model, you're only using that cross section for the case where everything is in hydrostatic equilibrium to choose the radius below which you thermalized. So the cross section is just thermalizing, that's all. And for that, it doesn't matter if it's attractive or, or repulsive. Okay, because obviously that would, that would impact the, you know, the spin of the mediator, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So well, then, like, yeah, sure. But I, yeah, I agree with you. But for, for everything you, I, I care about here, you can choose whatever you want and have it be repulsive or attractive and you'll get the same result. Okay, thanks. Uh, one other question. Could you could you say a quick word about where your priors on the mass to light ratio are coming from? Are you doing like stellar population synthesis and, and going from there? Yeah, we're taking them from previous analyses. Uh, and to be honest, I don't know what the, um, I don't know what the original uh, data that it's taken from is. I, I need to look this up and get back to you. Sorry, I don't know if you could it, say- No that. worries, uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. But we did very <laughs> good priors over kind of a large range and found that the results were not sensitive. 
Um, okay, good. So now uh, just back to this plot. So as I said, you know, there's this bullet cluster bound and there seems to be kind of this question mark here. And just to explain to you where this question mark is coming from, and I've alluded to this already, if you ask the question, these two models, SIDM versus baryonic feedback, how do they create cores? And you plot like the, the coring, like let's say the slope of the inner region as a function of this ratio of stellar to virgin mass. It turns out that feedback has some sweet spots, some best value of this ratio for which you can create maximal cores. If you go to too low a ratio, there aren't enough baryons, so there's no supernova to go off and you don't get anything. And if you go to very high ratio, just because of the way things scale, it also turns off. So there's a sweet spot. Whereas SIDM up to arbitrarily low baryonic mass, you're fine, right? You can call. But it turns out the spark data is mostly in the region where these things are degenerate. And so it's not so weird that you can't really tell the difference between these two models for spark. You have to go down to lower mass objects if you ever want to do well. Okay. And so that's what we did. We went down to these lower mass objects, these dwarfs that are much cleaner. And we placed a new constraint here. And I'm going to tell you about that constraint. Okay. Maybe you already answered this question, but your analysis from the previous slide does it also set a bound on, like similar to the bullet cluster on the 100 kilometers of spectrum? We didn't do that analysis. There, there should be, and, and you should, yeah. So, what you would want to do is you would take the full model, right. you know, do a fit to, to all data and rule out some of the parameters. Space. And that's a, I mean, I've started working on that with some people in Israel. But it's like a low hanging fruit that hasn't been done. Uh, everything I said here did not include, that's an additional caveat. Adiabatic contraction was not included in these models. Good. Okay. Um, so let's go down to the smaller object now. And in order to tell you how we place this new constraint, um, I want to walk you through what you expect if I give you a self-gravitating sphere of SIDM and let it go. Okay, so let me tell you what happens. Okay, and what happens is, I mean, how do you answer this question? One thing you can do is just run a simulation, right? That's the kind of most straightforward thing to do. But because interactions are happening pretty fast, you can also do this in the fluid description. You can truncate your Boltzmann equations up at a finite uh, um, uh, moment, and you can write them down and solve the equations for the dynamics. And it turns out that you, you only need the first three moments plus some mass density relations. So there's four equations that govern the dynamics, and they are the mass density relation, the hydrostatic non equilibrium equation, the heat flux equation, and the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, you solve them, what you find turns out to exactly mimic simulations is that the central density rho core. As a function of time, if I start off with a dense profile, an NFW profile, something cuspy, what happens is the, the density goes down, has a long lived period, this is a log plot, a long lived period of low density, and then eventually goes sharply up exponentially um, and gets very, very large. What's going on? Okay, so what's going on is as follows. I told you we started with a dense profile, an NFW profile. So instead of plotting density as a function of radius, let me plot temperature or velocity dispersion of a function of radius. And what you find if you solve the equations, you find that the temperature of the function of radius is cold, hot to cold. Okay. And so if I ask how does heat flow here, heat flows from hot to cold. So it flows inwards initially. And heat flows inwards, it puffs up the center, it just creates more kinetic energy, and that creates a core. Okay. And you have this kind of long lived, almost equilibrium state, which is core. This is like the reason that SIDM was invoked in the first place to create these cores. But now if you wait long enough, what happens is that you're hot here and you have an outskirts, which are cold. So very quickly, actually, heat starts to flow in the opposite direction. It flows outwards from the core. And then you start evolving along this line and you reach this scenario, which is known as gravithermal core collapse. The same thing that has been studied for many years in the context of globular plastics. Okay. Let me just walk you through what these two things are so you get a bit of intuition. So this first stage, this equilibrium stage, is something we've talked about already for diversity. Okay? So if you have some NFW profile, there's going to be some radius below which you can solve for a given cross-section, 
below which your isotherm. Okay, so you can solve for this radius below which interactions happen faster than the age of the object. Your isothermal here, when you're isothermal, if you're almost in equilibrium, you can solve the genes equation in exact equilibrium. You get this exponential dependence on phi baryon. Then, as I told you already, if you're baryon dominated in cusp, your dark matter dominated in core. And that's the story. Good. Now, if you continue to wait, you reach this additional phase. And this phase is easy to understand if you know that all gravitationally bound, virialized objects have negative specific heat. If you write down the virial equation, there's this minor sign that relates energy to kinetic energy. So in these objects, if you remove energy, they heat up. Okay? They convert potential energy into kinetic energy by shrinking and increasing in temperature. So if you have some toy model of this, some inner region with negative specific heat and an outer heat bar, then if heat flows out, what happens in the center is that the object decreases in size, converts potential energy into kinetic energy, while it increases in density, increases in temperature, and now the heat gradient is even larger, so heat flows out more efficiently, and it's a runaway process. This is known as the gravitational catastrophe. Okay? Good. Well, in, in stars, it's different because there you have, first of all, dissipation and radiation pressure. So this, this is different, right? But this happens in globular cluster systems, right? You need to have what's happening is a scattering event is happening, and one particle is going to the outskirts while the other one is falling in. Yeah. You need that to be the dominant process for heat transfer in order for this to happen. Good. Now, in the regime where the mean free path is much larger than the size of the core, actually the equations are analytical. And one of the things that you can calculate very easily is what the time scale for reaching this core collapse regime is. And if you calculate what you find is it's 300 times the scattering time scale. And the 300 number is not a magic number. It's coming from like, if you want to back up the envelope it, just take this you know, sphere that I gave you and ask how long does it take for scattering internal scattering events to evaporate an order one mass. And that turns out to be 300 scattering times. Okay, so you can do that calculation on the back of the envelope. If you plug in real numbers, let's take one centimeter squared per gram, and let's take densities and velocities of Draco, one of the satellites of the Milky Way, you get 700 gigahertz. So a super long time. Okay, so one centimeter squared per gram. In principle, you would think we never have to care about. Do you have a question? Yeah, kind of maybe annoying. So, like, roughly, all your questions are annoying. Yeah. It's the same as, like, most scatters don't, like, most scatters aren't lucky enough. Um, I'm not sure if that's the statement. I don't know. Uh, why, why, like, why are you saying that? Uh, well, because it takes, you know, an average guy needs to go through 300 scatters. It's not an average guy. It's, it's 300 scattering time. That doesn't mean that, an act, that, that each particle has 300 scatters. That's not what it means at all, right? It's sure, just... Those aren't completely no. unrelated. I mean, that's roughly what it means. Like it's possible that the guy who evaporates does not have 300 scattering on average, but like on average, he has gone through about 300 scattering. You know, actually, I think you're right. Yeah, I think that's a true statement. And you're saying this is because most scatters are unlucky scatters. Yeah. That could be a way of thinking about it. I haven't actually thought about it in this language ever, but. So, so I guess there's two different ways that it could be dominated. One is like most scatters are unlucky, but when you get a lucky scatter, you leave. Or the other is like somehow you're getting some slow buildup that you're dominated by like some random one uh, that, that, that eventually leads to escape. What I'm curious about is like, is this, uh, is, is, what would it take to change that number from 300? Like that, that number, as I understand it, is actually a statement about like gravity in three plus one D or something like this. It is, well, it, I'll, I'll show you in a second something that changes that number from 300 to much smaller numbers. Okay. And later in the talk, I'll show you something that changes it from 300 to much larger numbers. And then you'll get a feeling of what kind of things can change it. I'll give you an example that I'm not going to talk about today, dissipation. Dissipation changes this to much smaller numbers. You can radiate away light particles. Then you can decrease this time because you can get rid of energy more efficiently. Um, okay, sure. 
radiate away light particles? Which particles? Like the phi particles, like the mediator. That's why I understand the phi. Well, I'm going to be working the regime where the it's an alpha dependent question as well. So I'm going to be I'm working the regime where that process is unimportant. There's another regime of the same model where it is important. Okay. Then you can decrease this by that. Be the phi being lighter. You have to have phi light and you have alpha large enough. Yeah, I mean, but that's because you're not having you're not having like. I don't know, you're not going elastic scattering, right? So, like, this is a statement about elastic scattering. Uh, well, no. So, what I meant is in the regime where you have both elastic scattering and you can also radiate particles. So, both processes are on at the same time. Ruben has a paper about this. Yeah, we can yeah, look at it together. I mean, sure, of course, that's different because it's a different process. But, sure, okay. Uh, you, you, yeah, you, but okay, let me show you. Let me show you two things where, let me show you right now where this number goes down. Okay. This number goes down when? For example, you truncate the outskirts of the object. Okay, so if you change the gradient of the temperature on the outskirts, then that allows heat to flow more efficiently. For example, you're changing the pressure on the outskirts. Tidal stripping can do this. For example, if you have a satellite that tidally strips itself by interacting with its host, then this happens. And actually, what these authors showed is that as you do that more and more, as you truncate more and more, the time scale for collapse decreases. Substantially. Okay, so that's an example. Okay, so you need you need like scattering also a particular halo profile. It depends on the halo profile, of course. Yeah, yeah. 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 it right. depends on the on the gradient of temperatures. Right. Okay. And so even though naively you would think that like one to ten centimeters squared per gram never has this happen, for realistic scenarios, actually that's not true because truncation does happen for tidal strip. Okay. One more additional consequence that I want to talk about is that there's an effect of SIDM, which looks like ram pressure. As the satellite is moving through the background of its host, particles, SIDM particles, are now scattering with host particles or scattering with satellite particles. And since there's a large ratio in the velocity, the escape velocity is much smaller than the burial velocity of the host, which is the typical velocity of the wind. Almost every scattering event just ends up in both particles escaping. Okay. And so almost every scattering event creates an evaporation term in the equations. But you, you might also, also think that there's some amount of momentum transfer to the satellite. Yes, as the particle is escaping, it has to climb out of its potential well, and some amount of momentum can be transferred, but it's tiny. Okay, so you never have to care about this. Or you almost never have to care about this. Okay, so what we did to place this bound is I wrote a code that incorporates everything I just told you and a bunch more physics that I didn't have time to talk about today. So the slide is unimportant. We didn't go into the details, but basically this is telling you all the things we kind of incorporated into the, the model. And what, this, what this code can do is you, you take a satellite with some initial profile, you take a host with its profile, and you put some orbital parameters for that satellite, and the code tracks everything that happens to the satellite at the time. Profile, the temperature, everything. Okay, and what we were able to do is place bounds on the parameter space. And so what I'm showing you here in the x-axis is this cross-section per unit mass at zero velocity. And in the y-axis is this ratio of m phi to m chi, or the velocity scale which you transition from constant cross-section to model scattering. These are the kind of most updated bullet cluster bounds. Okay, so this is not bullet cluster, this is other object. This is relaxation of, of clusters. And this is a bound that is approximately equivalent to like half a centimeter squared per gram and a thousand kilometers per second. Okay. And what we were able to do is place an additional bound in this region of the parameter space. And this is coming from measuring the central density of satellites like Draco through the velocity dispersion of stars at the center of Draco. You get a measurement for the average enclosed density below some radius, in this case, 150 parsec. That gives you a number which is inconsistent with SIM in this region because of overcoring. In this region of the parameter space, you get a central density that is too core to be consistent with Draco's measurement. And to place this bound, we've been uh, very careful to, for example, choose the burial mass of Draco, which is an unknown parameter, to be the thing that gives the weakest possible bound. And we've done that for all unknowns. Okay, so this is very conservative in that sense. Okay. Draco is one of the objects of the Milky Way that is very dense at its center. So it's the thing that's going to place the largest, this 
you know, it's, it's going to dominate your bound. We did this for a bunch of other objects. I'll show you in a second. And we're now in the process of doing like a full Bayesian analysis of all the objects. So this was kind of a proof of concept at the time we published this. But in general, a smaller object is better, A, because there's a field effect you're going around that was. Right? A, a small object is good because there's few baryons, so they're not a large effect. And um, the low velocity part. And the low velocity places a bound in the region of the parameter space that has not really been broken. Low. Yeah. But that's true. So Drake was an example where the variable mass is somewhere between like 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 10 solar masses, and there's like a thousand or two thousand stars. So this is a good example. And it's not contaminated too much by things like binaries. Yeah. So there's a there's a bunch of issues, but I don't really have the time to go into it. Yeah. Does the orbit of Draco change significantly? Like this is actually independent of the orbit of Draco. There's another bound that we placed over here where we took Gaia data for Draco and ran the orbit of, of Draco back one pericenter, so one passage, and asked where does RAM pressure kill Draco within one passage? That's this region that's ruled out anyway. So, so this bound, the orbit was unimportant. Draco, I believe, is like 50 kpc, something like that. I forget them around 50 kilometers, uh, 50 kiloparsec, approximately. Yeah, I forget somewhere between 50 and 100. Okay. Um, and the reason this region is allowed is because gravithermal core collapse can enhance the density enough to be consistent again. Okay. And this is accounting for with the stripping. This is including the effects of stripping. And nothing is special about Draco. We did this for a bunch of objects and found that Draco was the most conservative, which is the reason I'm highlighting it. And as I said, now we're in the process of doing this more carefully for all objects, the fast quality bats. Okay. Uh, and this is also consistent with simulations that were run after our analysis that find the same thing. Simulation with five centimeters per gram over core with respect to measurements of objects in the Milky Way. Okay. And so the take home is this we place this new bound over here, where you have some upper limit and some lower limit at low velocities. And so the consistent pictures are either this picture, a strongly self-interacting model, for which small objects, some of them have to be collapsing or have collapsed already. Or, you know, this is also allowed, you could have this very weakly interacting model, which you can call SIDA, or you could just call it C. And, and the small payloads uh, collapsing, that you you mean they are kind of in their first uh they have first collapsed phase. such that the core is smaller than the radius at which we place the measurement but the time scale for that to change is so fast that actually once they collapse they just collapse and, and then nothing changes in the future like if i were to wait another billion years I, it's not like these guys are going to dissipate in some actually way. if you wait infinite time this is a simulation that no one's done and you I would need to think about it, but my intuition is that the entire object would evaporate away if you wait an infinite time. But the time scale for that, I think, is large. Yeah. What, or what happens with the center of the center? Because in principle, if you just find one left, it goes to it, really arbitrarily high. Then. Yeah, but with arbitrarily small cores. Yeah. So you just get a power right. until you reach some cutoff of the theory. In, in global classes, the cutoff is binary formation. Mm -hmm. In this case, the cutoff can be like some relativistic instabilities, and then you might form a black hole. So it really depends on what the cutoff of your model is. But you just say you just ignore whatever happens. With the yeah, because I've checked that it always happens at a radius that's so small that you don't. Are there any one particle physics that explain the universe? You could cook up one, like two mediators probably does it. We can think of it if you want. Like, I, yeah, you could cook up a model that does this. A lot of particles. Yeah, you can do that. Okay. Um, good. So just to say it again, this is kind of the, what's left. Okay. You either have to be CDM or SIDM that's core collapsing for small objects. And so in the last few minutes, I'm just going to tell you how I think you can probe this region now. So I'm just going to spend five minutes and I'm not going to talk about everything I wanted to because of lack of time. Um, do, I, do I have like five more minutes? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. 
So this is the take home message. If you don't remember any, anything from the talk, just remember this slide. For SIDM to exist in nature, gravity thermal collapse must be active in some dwarfs at this point. Okay. And gravity thermal collapse is kind of this, you know, violent thing. So there must be signals. And let me tell you what some of them are. And everything I'm about to tell you is preliminary. So take it with a grain of salt and, and ask me questions or tell me that I'm saying something incorrect. And what I claim is that there are three things that are important to notice. One is the gravithermal core collapse is suppressed by ram pressure evaporation. This effect of interaction between satellite and host actually goes in the direction of turning core collapse off. And that's critical because core collapse has to be on to be consistent with nature. So if anything turns it off, that region of the parameter space is ruled out. Second, core collapse correlates in a non-trivial way with baryons and um, through gravity. And I can, if I don't have time, then I can talk about this offline if anyone's interested. And three is kind of answering your question, which is that core collapse cannot create arbitrarily large densities at a given radius, right? You just get a power law. It's not this magic thing that gives you whatever you want, right? There's a finite amount of mass. And so if you ever measure something which is very dense, but core collapse could never have given you that, that also rules it out. Okay. And all of these things also correspond to signals, obviously. So let's just talk about the first one for the next five minutes. And the point is as follows, you know, as I said, there's this, this blue particles that are bound, the red particles that are unbound belong to the host. And this, this object is moving through this background. And if you start off with some profile, blue, blue interactions are the thing that are, that's driving core collapse, internal collisions. Whereas blue, red interactions, ram pressure just reduce the density everywhere and these things compete with each other. Right? And there's rates involved, and these rates depend on these values, which are the satellite's density and the satellite's burial mass, and the host's density at the position of the satellite, and the burial velocity of the host. And it's just always true that the burial velocity of the host is larger than the burial velocity of the satellite, whereas the density of the satellite is much larger than the host's density at that position. And the rates go as follows. So the internal collision rate goes like rho satellite, the density of the satellite, times the velocity average cross-section at the velocity of the satellite. Whereas external scatterings go like the density of the host times the velocity average cross-section at the velocity of the host. These things are trying to compete with each other to create core collapse. And if this wins for any region of parameter space, if that object is super dense, then you rule out a part of the parameter space. And you could also talk about correlations that you would expect because of this phenomenology. This is observed in simulation. So recently, some people simulated satellites orbiting around the host, including this effect of evaporation for a constant cross-section. And if you just look at the solid curves here, each curve is a satellite orbiting on a circular orbit at a different radius. Okay. So the brown one is the curve with the largest radius, so the lowest evaporation rate. And uh, what you see is that you core collapse pretty fast. But as you go to smaller radii, this evaporation term becomes larger and larger, and you slowly turn off, have a larger time scale for collapse, until eventually the evaporation rate is so large that you don't collapse. Yeah. Giga years. Yeah, giga years. Good. Um, and so what we've done now in order to scan over the full parameter space is done the same thing in the fluid description. And what it turns out to correspond to is just writing down one additional equation, the continuity equation, and adding an evaporation term into the continuity equation. And I've written down everything in dimensionless form. And in particular, you'll see this gamma tilde over here, which is defined as follows. Gamma tilde is just the evaporation rate divided by the scattering rate. Okay at some time, which I call time zero. And so importantly, this is a ratio of rates, which mainly or mostly depend on observable quantities, right? It's the ratio of densities and the ratio of velocity average cross sections. And what we find is something that looks like this. As you increase this value, you slowly have core collapse happening slower and slower until eventually you get to some large value which core collapse completely turns off. Just to give you a feeling of what's happening in this green plot, so each curve, this is density as a function of 
radius for different times. So each curve here is a different time. These numbers seem to be very large, these times, but it's just because I've chosen a specific cross section to make these times. Actually, everything here is unitless. It's T tilde, it's gamma sat times the time. And so if I can change the cross section, I can change this time to whatever I want. And everything I'm about to tell you remains true. So forget about that. Just look at the trends. So I start with some NFW profile, the dash curve. Initially, I core, go down, but then core collapse turns on, and I eventually end up with this custom profile. Whereas the red curve corresponds to a completely different behavior. You start off with some cusky profile and you just core and then you start slowly to die. And so you understand where I'm going with this. Just a second, Jeff. If this was Draco, Dra this cannot be Draco. That's it. Yeah. This is always assuming you have a circular orbit, so it's always a constant. Yeah, agreed. This is a caveat. We haven't done this carefully yet. I'm just doing like the simplest thing, which is yeah. constant. And you would have to think about orbits and how these things change with time and try and be conservative and use data. You're right. So, so most of the, correct me wrong, like most of the satellites that we see are ones that are on like these uh, elliptical orbits. Correct. So, so they're going to be presumably dominated by like their closest number. Yeah, I think most of the action probably happens at pericenter, but I'm not sure about this because there's this non trivial interplay between density and velocity with different powers. Yeah. So it's not obvious that, it all, that the action happens at Perry Center, but I think that's probably true. Lower velocity is better. But exactly. exactly, exactly. Okay, so as I said, if this was Draco, that would be bad for Draco. Because the dark curve, there will be much higher yeah, well, this is normalized density and this is normalized radius. You would have to have additional inputs, like you know, the virial mass of the object in order to normalize this correctly. So that would be taken from like measurements or so something. Clearly, the moment itself is changing with the operation. Yeah, yeah, but my initial conditions and the, the definition of this rho tilde is rho divided by initial density. So it, when you solve the equations, you don't care about that normalization. The equations themselves are normalization independent. These equations are written in a way that I've just taken out the scales. Okay, let me answer this way to go back. Is there a perverse way to choose an initial condition such that Draco would satisfy red? Maybe, but that might be um, like starting with some crazy large mass, which is inconsistent for other reasons. So you run into like some prior problem. What is that? Like, let's say 10 to the 12 is definitely wrong. No, I don't know. I haven't done this analysis. Yeah. And we know Draco is uh, No, we know that Draco is not more than about the age of the universe. Now, approximately, it's the age of the universe. It's like 10 giga years. Yeah. yeah. So that's all. And Draco is a small object. It was born early. So it's approximately between 10 and 40. Okay, and so you can use this to place bounds. And I'm going to end with this. And so just to be clear, right? If this was Draco, you'd want this ratio to be large enough such that the evaporation rate is suppressed enough. And so what that corresponds is to pushing omega, the ratio of masses leftwards, small numbers. Okay, so it pushes omega to be small. And you can back up the envelope this to see what you would get approximately for Draco. I haven't done this carefully yet. I've just back up the envelope it. What I think it does is it rules out a, a, a region of the parameter space that's going to look like this. Yeah. But I haven't done it carefully. Good. Okay. So there's some additional predictions here. Uh, because of lack of time, I think I'm not going to talk about them. Um, let me just make the claim that, you know, I've talked about ruling things out, but there are also predictions of all of this. You could try and correlate the central density with this evaporation rate if you're able to somehow measure it and average over orbits. And so there are signals of everything that I've told you now, which could be searched for in data. I'm not going to have to look across different four galaxies. Yeah, exactly. Look at them. You measure central densities from dispersions. You ask what are the velocities and densities, and you try and estimate what the evaporation rate would be. Good. I'm going to stop here. And let me just end by saying, you know,
this is a nice time to be working on Milky Way dwarfs because over the last, you know, I don't know, many years, we had very few dwarfs until 15 years ago, this climbed up to like 60 today for the Milky Way, but LSST is gonna at least double this number within the next few years, if not more than double. And Gaia data is gonna give us orbits for all of these objects. So we're gonna have a ton of data to work with. So it's a really nice time to be working on these kinds of problems. And this is the summary observation point of velocity event cross section, such that core collapse is active in objects like Draco. And there are many potentially observable signatures that have to do with that fact, uh, which could be used to either detect or rule out these models within the next few years. I'm going to end here. Thank you. There's a paper by Spergel and Steinhardt that does this. If you have a sub dominant amount of SIDM with very large cross sections, you're consistent with everything, and then you can do that. You can. You want like the supermassive black hole, right? Yeah, you can do it, but you have to have a sub fraction of SIDM. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there any parameters? Into discs. You need dissipation for that. I think you need to somehow. You need to. You need something that transfers angular momentum for that to happen. So in this model, no. But there are other models for which you can do. So you're saying that your model is a scalar part of the model. Could it matter to anything? Um. Well, first of all, it can be a vector as well. It didn't matter. It only mattered. Like, really, all that matters is that you get a velocity dependent cross section. Really, that's it. Any model that gives you that, you're fine. I don't think so. I think you still get v to the minus four. Am I wrong? That's exactly Muller's cap, right? So it becomes a four point and the momentum transfer is smaller than the V. So what are you saying? You think it's V to what power? Uh -huh. Let's look at this paper carefully because the paper that just did model scattering in a dark sector, which is exactly that. No, no, we are in that region. Anywhere between like 10 and a hundred, 10 and a thousand kilometers per second is the region of interest. And you have to have it have fallen enough by a thousand to not hit bullet cluster bounds. Right? Yeah. You can go back to this plot. I think the nominal is better than capital higher than you are. And so, well, yes, the nominal is the same part. Oh, no, no, but this is all completely non relativistic. Oh, so even this is 10, like 10 to the, the, the minus. This is the yeah. So, so sorry. So, everything is completely non relative. Good. So, so you say um, this one, this first paper, which obviously is not very If you believe in these models, then it has to be velocity dependent. You could also just not believe in this model and say CDM with feedback, you're fine. That basically is this option. If you're doing this, you have to have feedback. Okay, so, so, okay. so when you say observation point to velocity dependent cross section, what you mean is if you have significant cross section, it must be velocity dependent. Which is the thing I would call SIDM. Yeah. Okay, okay, so if you're going to call it SIDM, you better. Say it's there's, there's no significant like favoring for that over not that I know of, even though previous claims in the literature have said that there is favor, but I think that's just not true. Okay. Question online.
Oh, are there? There was a comment before, uh, and it's still online, but Sarah came up with advice. I would add to this that we are planning for, uh, he was referring to, I guess, to the claim about the parallel feedback. Um, radiative, radiative transfer significantly alters the impact that the SM feedback has on the density profiles. So there's still a vast amount of well known parallel physics that should be in the Sorry, I don't understand the question. It was a comment, actually. Comment on the fact that. Uh, Radiative transfer, for example, is one of the factors that impacts on this supernova feedback and its effect on the profiles. So it was pointing out that there is a lot of baryonic physics that could be included in the simulations. Help screen. For CDN. For CDN, yeah. So That's, I agree with that. For sure. Okay. Yeah. 